I think about mission. What does it take to complete a mission? Well, it depends on what the mission is. A lot of leaderships will tell you single-minded focus will get you to where you need to go on your mission. If you have a mission to, to be number one in sales, you do whatever it takes to be number one in sales. Whatever the job is, whatever the mission is, focus. I knew a man who never was never home because his mission was to work, 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 and to build his company. And there was, in the workroom where the employees were, there was a, there was a Dilbert cartoon, something about uh, Dilbert and his, his boss coming and his family saying, who's that man who was just here? Well, that's your father. Oh, very fitting for this man because he was never home, not much. His mission was something in his mind was greater, perhaps even though more than his family. Is that what it takes to complete the mission? Loving God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength to the exclusion of your family and friends? You've got to think about that a bit. Is this what Jesus tried to show his disciples and us? Currently, I'm reading a historical novel called Unbroken by Laura Hildebrand. It's a true story of, told by Louis Zamperini, who was a bombardier serving on a B-24 in World War II in the Pacific. I never really knew that much about bomber pilots and the crew and bombers. I heard more about the Corsairs and and the fighter pilots and that kind of thing. But this was kind of, I'm about a quarter of the way through the book, but it's very eye-opening. They have missions, several missions. And the way he describes the B-24, it shouldn't even be flown. <laughs> so it was big, it was a tank, it was hard. It was like trying to steer an elephant on gravel road. It was just awful. And he was the bombardier. He was the one that was sighting the, the sights up for, for the bombing missions. They said oftentimes they come back with looking like Swiss cheese with all the bullet holes that the, the, the Japanese zeros would put in their planes. They said they often lost members of the crew who were caught in crossfire in the plane as the bullets were zipping through the plane hull. They weren't cer certainly sure if, if everyone would make it back to base. And oftentimes the, the plane barely made it back to base, almost by a divine intervention. As the plane lands, in one instance, somebody takes the hand and they just tear the wing, the tail right off the plane. It was that fragile. How would they get it back? And they get a new plane and a few new crew members and they go up again and they do it again. The pilot does everything in his power, the co-pilot, everything in his power to do the mission and get people home safely if they can. Sometimes it's difficult when your co-worker, when your, when your crewman is, is bleeding and you're trying to do your job and stop the bleeding and, and take care of the people that you're, that you're with. Do you think they were doing the old service to others with all their being in this instance? Probably more than likely. The ideal conditions weren't there. The plane wasn't ideal, the mission wasn't ideal, and truth be told, I guess more accidents happened, more, more pilots and crew members were killed in training accidents than actual combat. That's unbelievable. I never knew that before. Reading the book gave me an appreciation for the care and concern that these crewmen had for, their, for the members of their crew, the pilots and co-pilots. Love with all their strength all their soul, with all their mind, because that's who they had at the moment. Part of combat. This is not to glorify war by any means, because we know that people who serve in war don't want to be there. That's the last thing they want to do. But as Jesus shows with his washing of his feet, disciples' feet, in the midst of knowing he's going to be betrayed, in the midst of knowing that the elites are out to get him, in the midst of knowing that God has sent them on a mission to die, throughout all this, 
He takes time to serve his disciples in a very meaningful and vulnerable way. Did they think he was the king? Did they, did they think that Jesus was going to save them and, and be a, a king of sorts? And if so, was this the kind of behavior a king does? It's more like a slave. Their world is turned upside down. They don't know what to think. With all of this, I believe as Jesus' hope and his wish that not only would the disciples wash each other's feet, but they would extend the boundaries to others as well. Now, in men's breakfast and Bible study, we talked about the, the great commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew, Mark, Luke say the neighbor. And if you'll notice, this reading says each other. John's community is a little bit more closed. But I think that Jesus was wanting them to go outside the boundaries of their own little group. It's hard to think of these, these vets who are flying missions to extend the boundaries to those who are Japanese, to those who are of a different culture or time, who are the enemy, not the neighbor as we define it. But then we have to stop and think, who is our neighbor? What does Jesus mean, neighbor? Well, he said the Good Samaritan was an example of the neighbor, right? The guy didn't know the other person in the ditch. He was a Samaritan. He had his own boundary issues with dealing with only Samaritans for the most part, and he extended himself to be a good neighbor to someone he didn't even know, to help, to check back, to give more than just a glance and a walking away. To love more with strength and mind and heart and soul. Jesus, in his humanness, struggled, I'm sure, with knowing all these things are, that are going on in his mind about the betrayal and the elites and the plots and the, the death and the Satan's opposition to what he's doing to stay with his disciples to show the earthiness of actions that only a king of God would do because that's what God is like to show them that no one is, no one is above serving others and I saw in the Huffington Post or the news again that Pope Francis is at it again. No pomp and circumstance for him. He's at a nursing home washing the feet of the elderly and the disabled, kissing their feet, kneeling, humbling himself. All part of what God, I think, has in mind for us. With all the technological advances we have with the world becoming smaller and smaller, we can understand other cultures better and better. We can, we can learn more about who is our neighbor and who should be our neighbor and who to include even though it seems strange. Washing the feet of friends is easy, although it does show us a sense of vulnerability that we're not really comfortable with. Washing hands is cool. We can do that. Feet, eh, it's a different kind of thing. I have long toenails. I have stuff between my toes. And yeah, it's a little bit different, sometimes strange. But to wash the feet of someone you don't know, someone who is different than you, imagine what it would be like if the leaders of the world washed each other's feet, metaphorically, symbolically. What would that be like? Instead of showing strength through militaristic means, what it would it be like to show vulnerability? Pie in the sky thinking, right? Well, you've got to start somewhere, I guess. We send out service missions to around the world. We send service missions to, to the inner city, to wherever we find people in need or hurting. And we go, hopefully, with an understanding of mutuality, of learning, of having them serve us in different ways than we ever served them. To go away feeling good, but also knowing, having them feeling good about being helped. 
leaving them a little better off, maybe even if it doesn't mean we're better off. That's tough. That's tough. Jesus says, after my death, I'm going to my Father. Well, first he, he comes back, new life, resurrection, feeds his buddies at the shoreline with fish, meets them in the room and shows them his hands and his feet. There's more to this story than meets the eye initially. There's more to Jesus than meets the eye initially. Washing feet is a simple gesture, important at that time because of the sandals and the dirt that they often wore and trudged through. But it was about relationship building that Jesus wanted to do with his disciples. I call you friends. The relationship just notched up a level from disciples to friends. A couple days before his crucifixion, his mission was to die on the cross and be resurrected to a new life. But he took the time for one, perhaps, mission to, to sum up his, his ministry on earth, his life on earth with his disciples, with his, with his loved ones. This is what it means. This is what it's all about. This is what I've been doing this whole time. I'm summing it up for you. Doesn't come any clearer than that. The foot washing and the crucifixion, the events form a ladder between here and God and heaven, forming the rungs of a new relationship, something different. Now, a community of disciples like us oftentimes are bathing in the love and concern for other people, but they're also, you know, it gets tough sometimes. Sometimes it lives falsely against God's love and betrayal and faithlessness, but that's reality, too. It's not all pie in the sky. It's an earthy, realistic kind of life. We have the dichotomy of this love that God has for us and the love we show for other people, but there's still this tension sometimes within a community of people because we're human beings. We're earthy. And God knows that. So the sacrifice of Jesus like washing the feet, wipes us clean. One swift motion, one swipe of the hand with water over the feet, a towel, a gesture of kindness, of subordination, of love, of service. The intimate relationship with God, that's the foundational part of Jesus' ministry. Intimacy with God. What do we talk about this morning? Love each other too. Somebody was saying that, well, if you love God, then you don't need the second commandment because it should come naturally. But I'm human. You know, I need to have it spelled out sometimes. Love your neighbor. Be a good neighbor. Sometimes it's tough. But that's where God's love covers all. The grace of God covers all that. We hurt when others hurt. Not only in this country, I imagine that people are feeling, you know, with a Malaysian flag going down and not being found, all those people lost, the, the ferry tipping over in South Korea, those people lost. You have a sense of, of hurt for people that are halfway around the world. You don't know them. But in some sense, they become our neighbor because we share the experience of humankind, of our humanness. And Jesus is there to show us that. We wash the feet of, of each other. And we include the other, whoever that may be. Because that's the example Jesus set on this Monday, Thursday, right before his crucifixion. This is what it's all about. I'm washing your feet. You're mine. You're in your intimate relationship with me now. Blessed be God. Amen.